Okay, uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us on uh, our third and final day of the event. Uh, I think we have a, another excellent program ahead of us. Just before we begin, I would like to start uh, today's event with an uh, acknowledgement that the land wow. I'm speaking from is situated, as well as my Carleton University campus across the street on traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. <clears throat> I want to honor, uh, my, excuse me, acknowledge and honor the people and treaties of the unceded lands of the Fertile Item. So another great day ahead of us. Uh, uh, just before we introduce our keynote today, uh, uh, earlier this year, a couple of us from the BRIC committee had the opportunity to attend a, a Wilfrid Laurier a symposium on Indigenous Status Sovereignty, in which uh, our speaker, uh, Robin Rowe, was one of the three panelists. And we thought it would make an important contribution to today's event, especially since many of us, at least on the library side, are increasingly collaborating with our scholarly communications and data services initiatives. And we've seen in the last few years, the emergence and growth, for example, of the data set and data as a first class uh, research object uh, with an increasing number of publications and funding agencies requiring data sets to be available for replication, reuse and sharing. And in Ontario, for example, it's manifesting through the uh, data, Dataverse publishing platform, which uh, our consortium of academic libraries has been uh, engaging many of our scholars in uh, getting uh, their data published. Um, so it introduces many new questions and issues around uh, data and data sets. And our speaker uh, today begins with a, a talk on Indigenous data sovereignty and research in Canada. Uh, Robin Rowe is a, a, a PhD candidate, Indigenous Data Team Lead, Health Data Research Network Canada, a research associate with the School of Rural and Northern Health at uh, Laurentian University in Sudbury, a sessional professor with the School of Indigenous Relations at Laurentian University, and Robin is uh, Anish uh, Anishinaabekwe and hereditary member of the Temet Agama Anishinaabe. She's a PhD candidate and research associate in the School of Rural and Northern Health at uh, Laurentian University. And her primary uh, research focus is on aspects of indigenous uh, data sovereignty uh, in both national and international avenues. So I will uh, pleasure to turn it over to Robin for the keynote presentation. Thank you much. Um, I am going to share my screen here. Awesome. This is working, right? Yep. Yep. All good. Awesome. So, Ani uh, Bojo, quick way, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about Indigenous data sovereignty in Canada and beyond. And then I'm going to kind of narrow down into a little bit of a discussion on applying an Indigenous data lens uh, to the impacts of bibliometric and research outcomes. So I'm going to start by introducing myself. I'm going to introduce a really high level discussion on Indigenous data sovereignty and governance. Um, this is going to be a much kind of briefer uh, version of, of um, IDSOV discussion than I usually present, but then I'm going to go into some um, some of my perspectives and some of my thoughts on how these things relate to the topic of bibliometrics and research impacts, maybe stir some ideas and thoughts, and uh, then have a Q&A. So, Ani Bojo Kwekwe, Robin Ronan Indishnikaz, Temi Yogaman and Donjaba, Wabi Makwan and Dodam. You just did an excellent job presenting all of my academic spaces. So I'm also a mother of four, and uh, I come to you today from the traditional territories of the Atikamekshing Anishinaabek and the Wanapate First Nation, uh, which is also known as Sudbury, Ontario. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. So thank you so much for inviting me. And with that, I will just jump right into um, talk a little bit about data. <clears throat> 
So as you all know, data has the ability to impact decision making, influence health policy, leverage funding and improve health outcomes. As a health researcher, that's typically the avenue that I come to um, my work with is, is looking at how it impacts health. And um, even in the space of bibliometrics, I mean, the, the, the purpose for um, having these, these methods and these processes. Oh, am I still here? I'm having issues connecting. Yeah, we see you. You're just kind of okay. Second, but you're back. Oh, okay, good. Um, so yeah, so so even in the work of bibliometrics, it's important to, um, you know, recognize that all of this work that we're doing is to advance health outcomes, right? Um, improve society's health. So data expansions within the age of digitization are really happening very quickly. And what they're leading to are global, global movements on how Indigenous data is respected and cared for um, within these spaces. And so if you're unfamiliar, Indigenous data, uh, it, it, this includes any information in any format that affects Indigenous lives at the individual or collective levels. My dog is to say hi to me, um, information on land, resources, people, and nations, it is counted for in Indigenous data. And so if it has to do with an Indigenous life, it is Indigenous data. And so Indigenous data sovereignty is um, the right of Indigenous peoples to govern the collection, application, ownership uh, of Indigenous data and information. And Indigenous data governance, in that case, are the mechanisms by which Indigenous data sovereignty are activated. And so I'll talk a little bit more about Indigenous uh, data governance mechanisms as we go. I hear somebody's mic on, is that normal? Um, so Indigenous data sovereignty movements are happening globally. Indigenous people around the world have inherent collective rights as, as um, are written in the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous of Indigenous Peoples, the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and uh, so these collective rights, in order to provide research outcomes that are relevant to Indigenous populations, there is an important role for mainstream and settler organizations within these spaces. And so it's important to recognize that Indigenous peoples have these inherent rights. These rights include self-determination, sovereignty, self-governments, and these things are not uh, gained, they're not earned, they're not granted by some governing body, they simply exist as Indigenous peoples. So as Indigenous peoples continue to assert our inherent rights um, the primary goals are really nation rebuilding through self-determination and self-government. Non-Indigenous organizations can contribute to these spaces by working with Indigenous nations towards accomplishing Indigenous priorities. So by helping to eliminate obstacles, barriers, and advocating for changes to oppressive systemic policies and practices, this is how we can advance these conversations. And so globally initial initiatives are happening. And so they're really rooted in uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So UNDRIP um, marks a milestone for Indigenous peoples globally. as an international human rights instrument that was adopted by the United Nations uh, General Assembly in 2007. It, uh, the UNDRIP outlines a set of minimum standards that are aimed at protecting Indigenous peoples around the world. And so it's really the most inclusive international instrument reaffirming the rights of Indigenous peoples. And it outlines 46 articles that uh, are, are meant to represent the core values that are important to Indigenous peoples from a global perspective. And so those include the right to self-determination, self-government, dignity, diversity, the, the right to participate in decision-making, the right to determine and develop priorities and strategies, the right to maintain control, protect and develop intellectual property, the right to determine our own identity and membership, among other um, specific avenues. And so grounded in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indig Indigenous Peoples, uh, global Indigenous data sovereignty movements are really leading to discussions around how to respectfully and appropriately govern Indigenous information. And so whether that information has to do with um, things that have to do with our land or our territories or our resources, our people, or our nations in general, uh, these global movements are shifting the landscape and addressing injustice through government and sovereignty. And so one of those movements is the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, and so, um, or GIDA, uh, 
So Gita, it, it, it evolved from an international indigenous data sovereignty interest group that was situated within the Research Data Alliance. And um, the, the group of Gita found ways to in, in, in implement um, the care principles. So the care principles were designed to be people and purpose oriented and to complement the already existing fair principles. So in the data space, you're likely familiar with data that is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And so this is really about open data. And what um, some of these conversations are missing is this is recognizing the diversity of Indigenous peoples and the need to um, understand and incorporate the collective benefit of Indigenous nations into those discussions and that Indigenous people have the authority to control what that data and what those conversations look like. And that throughout all aspects of the data space, um, responsibility is being, you know, is considered as recognizing Indigenous people's rights and that Indigenous ethics are incorporated as well. So um, the slogan, be fair and care, um, evolved from those discussions and there's work going on um, around the world to try to implement the care principles and find ways to actually activate the care principles in environments that are already using FAIR. And so really these, um, these globally, these are processes that are in place uh, that Indigenous data users are taking into consideration, these specific rights and interests of Indigenous peoples. So in Canada, uh, again, you're likely very familiar with these, these things, I'm assuming, um, if you're at all handling Indigenous or First Nations, in this case, data. So in Canada, we have um, three distinct groups of Indigenous peoples, so that's First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. And each uh, of these groups, they have di uh, diverse languages, diverse cultures, diverse ways of knowing, being, and living. And uh, of those groups, there are the First Nations principles of OCAP that were developed. So these are an example of governing data governing principles uh, that are pretty far far reaching. Um, if you are familiar with, you know, the Tri Council policy and things like that, the the OCAP principles have been embedded um, in that over the years in different ways. And so. Um, Go, awesome. Governing principles that highlight, um, these are governing principles that highlight how data should be collected, protected, used, and shared. They offer education and training opportunities um, that really respect First Nations autonomy and governance. And uh, like they, they really are just an example of who owns, you know, considering those aspects, who owns the data, who controls data, who accesses that data, and who possesses that data. And uh, um, historically, possession was about, you know, who, how is it in my physical possession? Where, where do, as a First Nations um, community, where am I putting that data? And it has evolved a little bit to include, um, you know, it's just where it is in the world where it, data exists in the world. And so whether that be in an archive or a library, um, that the ownership control access to that information is still uh, governed by indigenous nations and respected. So really over 30 years of work has been done in Canada to lay not only the foundation, but it's really provided a structure for successful nation to nation rebuilding for indigenous peoples across the country. And so it's really just about actually now let's do it. Right? Let's actually follow through. Um, so the report of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples uh, that was formed in 1991 and the report was released in 1996. So this document is, uh, is a very lengthy document and it outlines all kinds of areas that need to be addressed. And this includes uh, the health and wellness of Indigenous people um, and, you know, goes all the way down to discussing how Indigenous information governed by Indigenous peoples and that that process can assist in ensuring the health and wellness of nations. And uh, more recently, you're likely familiar with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. So the TRC has call to actions and uh, those call to actions call on different levels of government to basically make the changes that are necessary in order to address the systemic failures of uh, preceding governments and you know, just colonialism in general. And uh, finally, the final report from the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, there is a list of call, calls for justice um, in that document that has also been adopted and recognized by 
uh, the federal government. As an example of what these kinds of calls look like, so the TRC, um, the call to action number 18, sorry, <laughs> call to number, um, to action number 18 acknowledges that the current state of Indigenous health in Canada is a direct result of previous Canadian government's policies, uh, including residential schools. So it right off the top recognizes that these things are systemic. These things are so deeply rooted that they actually impact the overall wellness of Indigenous people moving forward and that it's important to establish measurable goals to identify and close these gaps in health outcomes. Recognize, respect, and address the distinct health needs of Métis, Inuit, and off-reserve Indigenous people as well, and to fully adopt and implement the UNDRIP, as was previously mentioned. And so, to, to clarify, the TRC was adopted in 2015 by um, uh, Justin, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. And so the federal government has agreed to implement the TRC and as such has agreed to implement the UNDRIP. So in Canada, advancing Indigenous data governance really needs to be reflective of the rights and interests of the three distinct Indigenous groups. So First Nations, Métis, Inuit. And uh, within these three groups, we also really need to recognize in all the work that we're doing that there is this diversity that exists in languages, cultures, traditions. And so that really means honoring traditional relationships and the treaties. Um, and so what does all of this kind of mean in terms of research outputs? So, Indigenous led research needs to inform Indigenous rights and interests. That's, that's the, that's the goal, right? So, this involves Indigenous led processes from the inception of research ideas. So, in order to truly advance Indigenous data sovereignty, Indigenous data governance, and to actively um, pursue reconciliation, researchers must recognize that this isn't about your wonderful idea and the work that you want to do. It's about making sure that research is being um, developed, Indigenous led um, by Indigenous peoples at that from, from the inception, from the very, you know, from the time the idea is born, it should be coming straight from communities because communities know what they want. They know what they need. They know where things are, are necessary. And, um, and so it's really important to see, you know, where, um, what, what a community says, because sometimes we look at the data that exists in the world and we think, oh, you know, oh, it looks like there's really high rates of, of diabetes in um, these communities along, along this region of the world. And I want to go and I want to study this, you know, study diabetes and understand why it is that uh, nations have diabetes. And, um, and then you go, and if you're actually putting the work in and actually putting the time in, you might learn that the, the, there's no food that the, you know, there's a lack of um, support systems to get healthy whole foods to the communities. So we're looking at diabetes, but you know, should we be looking at diabetes? And nations will tell you what you should be looking for. So indigenous guidance and leadership should be integrated at every point of the decision-making process. So it's a big process. It's a big time consuming process to do uh, indigenous research uh, appropriately. So, um, anti-colonial mindsets um, are really leading to more Indigenous-led research and, as a result, more Indigenous-led journals. So, as we evolve, as time elapses, as more and more people recognize the value and importance of documents like the TRC, the calls for action within them, and, you know, wake up to the fact that um, so much wrong has been done and now it's time to undo that wrong, there is this, this increase in, you know, indigenous led uh, work and that includes journals. And so some of these journals, because they haven't been established for a very long time, or because they focus on indigenous information and indigenous um, appropriate indigenous process, you know, they may have a uh, lower impact factor. So they may be designed to advance indigenous priorities and indigenous led capacity, but they may not be as heavily recognized as, as another journal, as a more mainstream journal journal. So, um, for example, there's the Canadian journal of native studies. That's a pretty high, um, a recognized journal. There's native studies review, uh, turtle Island journal of indigenous health, uh, the international journal of critical indigenous studies, international, Indigenous 
policy journal. You know, there's all these different journals that are specific and um, really adhere and advance to the rights of Indigenous peoples. And so we want to use those journals, right? As Indigenous peoples, our nations read those journals. So we want to um, make sure that we're publishing in those kind of spaces. And, um, and so that can be a little bit of a challenge when you're, you're fought, like facing uh, the decision of whether or not to publish in that journal or to publish in one that is more recognizable. So I was listening to some of the speakers yesterday. And one gentleman, uh, Chris Belter, he shared uh, that in his organization, the purpose of their framework is really like the ultimate goal um, of everything that they do is to advance health. And so all of the work that he um, he was talking about, like the end goal of it all was improved health. And so in order to ensure that um, health is supported, the systems are designed to figure out how to divide things like funding. So as he was speaking, I was picturing an image of a circle. And if you're on the call, Chris, I, I'm going to borrow a little bit of what I learned from you, um, or at least what I believe I learned from you. And I'm gonna integrate it with some of the other things that I, I've, I've been learning about biometrics because it's never actually been on my radar. So, um, and that's actually almost a point in and of itself that, that I'd never even thought about biometrics because they mean nothing to my nations, right? They mean nothing to the partners that I work with. But um, from what I understood of Chris's discussion and the discussion of other presenters, biometrics serve um, a couple of purposes and they're used to drive funding decisions. They're used to decide who is going um, to get the good job in the world of research uh, through things like the H index and all of these things have an effect one way or another on uh, the employability or recruitment process of people within academia. And I'm sure I'm missing some other important things, but uh, we'll just start there. So I started thinking about all these things and I'm thinking, okay, so let's say I have a proposal. I have this really fantastic idea. I need dollars and cents. I'm a mainstream researcher. And um, I, so I, I just, I need the dollars. I need the cents to make this happen. So let's say I submit my proposal idea to a funding agency. The aging agency is now, they're going to scrutinize me, not only on my proposal, but on me. They're going to, they're going to look to me. They're going to look to my H index. They're going to look to, you know, my team, what we bring to the table, how much of a potential for success our, our proposal has. And, uh, let's say they give us the funding. So I got me the dollars and cents, um, which is great. Finally, I'm, I'm going to be able to do this wonderful idea that, uh, that I need need to do and it's a two-year funding opportunity so two years later i'm done i've completed my manuscript it's ready for publication i decide to publish let's say with the lancet um from there i'm going to have a great big audience obviously because it's the lancet the lancet is fantastic and people love to love things that are fantastic and so my work is accepted um and now because I'm amazing and I did all of these things exactly right. My biometrics will be rated on the outcomes of this work and these metrics will look at how well it informed the community, how robust my infrastructure is, what sort of environment I work in, because biometrics require data and information to draw on, to create inferences. Um, so that kind of thing like my equipment, my buildings, my people, um, all these things would, would be taken into consideration and um, these processes would be used to evaluate how awesome I am in according to whatever rating, whatever scale exists. And uh, then it will take into account how well my paper is advancing health outcomes, right? Because I'm in the Lancet, people are seeing this. And so, um, and as a health re researcher, I mean, that's my goal. But that's my goal. My goal is that I need people to see this research because it's invaluable and you're, you're going to want to see it. Um, and then however my paper is taken within the world of academia um, will ensure that those policies are advanced, right? So you're going to see my awesome paper is going to get lots of traction. It's going to advance policies. Um, it's going to lead to new awesome research. It's going to build my team. It's going to, you know, drive my research program forward and, and we'll just go around and around. And I mean, I'm making my circle go round and around, but at the same time, other people are like, wow, that's a really great idea. And it triggered a new idea for me and I'm going to go do more research. And that's how we, you know, this ultimate cycle of um, 
the higher my research impact, the higher chance of my research growing and that work picking up momentum and the easier it will be ultimately for me to get funded, for me to get tenure, for me to get a higher uh, paying professor position and around and around and around we go. Academia is really funny, isn't it? Um, now, if you're familiar with the process of um, using and accessing Indigenous data, then you are likely familiar with the time and effort it can sometimes take to ensure uh, that you have done all of the necessary work to even get access to the data, let alone analyze it. I'm sorry, I'm hearing my own echo. I believe someone has their mic on. Um, yeah, so and if you're familiar at all, oh, it's still on. So, if you're familiar at all um, with, with the process of Indigenous data and research, then you know how difficult it is to access data, analyze it, and then publish it. Um, and so respecting Indigenous data sovereignty and governance structures means doing a whole pile of things that aren't exactly required by all research, research or researchers. And so um, first, if I want to have my research proposal even considered, again, remember inception, this can't even be my idea. This has to be somebody else's idea and, and it has to be born from the community and led by the community. So I need to engage with my partners before I even design a project. I need to engage with my partners throughout the design process. And uh, I may get to the end. I may get to the end. I've created a proposal. Everybody's on board and changes in position, um, a lack of capacity, potentially a number of other reasons. My partners could leave, you know, um, I didn't build a good enough relationship and I got to the end of my proposal development and it can't be moved forward because I no longer have my partners. And I mean, that's not an uncommon thing. And it's something that as Indigenous researchers, you know, we, we learn to kind of roll with those punches and uh, recognize that every opportunity, um, and I say every opportunity purposely, every one of these kinds of situation is an opportunity for growth and for learning and for understanding that, uh, you know, maybe I rushed that process. Perhaps I didn't build my relationships well enough. And, you know, it's a reflective, a self-reflective process, but it does happen. So what ends up coming from these kinds of things is uh, requiring a whole new relationship building process. So then a funding agency, they tend to fund mainstream spaces with lots of staffing, with lots of, you know, potential. We, we need to make sure that you have all the things, right? You can actually accomplish this work. We're not going to give you money and then maybe you won't be able to finish it because you only have a team of three people. Um, so what comes of that is that we may be less likely to fund an Indigenous organization or community without having first... Um, the the community support to move forward so indigenous researchers are often working on many things at the same time and doing so with very limited infrastructure and very limited capacity and this is a reality you know like you can have um we're usually just just getting by there's a lot of work to be done and there's so few of us doing it and uh, unfortunately all of our projects are not always funded and this can be really challenging so if we've made a commitment and we've gone through the entire process of building that connection and that relationship with our partners uh, sometimes we just figure it out and we do it anyways because we committed because we made an agreement and and we want to follow through um, because we don't want to let our partners down and uh sorry i'm not realizing what's coming up and what's not so um there are also many established non-Indigenous researchers who are leading Indigenous related work. Now, this is definitely a path, uh, a point in a path that was very, very necessary in order for Indigenous peoples to be able to find their voice, um, build that capacity to make that space, that very necessary space, that process required to um, like create the space for Indigenous voices to be heard. And so non-Indigenous researchers are still working in the space. And some are still working in the space where they um, 
you know, it's the same as it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago, because they've been there a long time and, and may not actually recognize the importance of, um, indigenous leading indigenous leading projects, um, indigenous authorship, things like that. And, uh, so those, those situations, what can happen is now you've got these very well established non indigenous researchers who can do both things, right? They're doing indigenous work over here. Maybe they're doing non indigenous work there. And so they might have, um, higher biometrics to begin with. And so funding agencies might actually favor them in the long term because they're established or, and they may be published in mainstream journals because they don't think that it matters, um, that indigenous, you know, perhaps. These are just kinds of the kind of things that uh, that come to mind when I'm thinking about the potential uh, challenges to these processes. And so selection selection may be based on uh, those biometrics and standard measures of success and uh, may fail to those standard measures of success may fail to recognize the values of relationships that are built with communities or maybe even fail to recognize the importance of community based research and indigenous researchers may get passed by for funding opportunities and ultimately um you know not get the dollars and cents so um in terms of moving forward then if an indigenous researcher is accepted let's say they got the dollars and cents or they're doing it off the side of their desk anyways right because that's what we end up doing um their work is completed and a manuscript is completed uh, throughout that process and there's more work required to actually get to the end goal of a manuscript that's even if a nation says oh yeah i'm totally okay with open data you can definitely publish my manuscript there and you can share my information here and it's fine and i don't i don't mind at all um which isn't always the case right because nations are very aware of how um how our information has been used and abused for centuries Right, like taken and and used in ways that were, um, you know, misused and appropri appropriated. And so, um, but if you get it and you get the funding and it's accepted, we have to go through the vetting process. And um, when it comes to vetting, we really want to make opportunities, right? Because all at the same time, we're doing all these things. We also are trying to build capacity. And uh, so we want to make sure that we are creating authorship opportunities for our, our uh, partners. And so when it comes to publication, sometimes, you know, again, it's, it's community partners, somebody, maybe an elder who's never published anything in their life is the lead author on a paper. And who's, who in a high profile journal is going to look at somebody who doesn't even have an undergrad and, and say, it's okay, right? So those kinds of, like, it's the way we think about, um, Changing the narrative on publications is, is important. So indigenous uh, led journals are often the first choice for indigenous researchers, which may mean less research recognition and uptake. At this point in, in indigenous research methodologies as well, there um, has likely been a series, series of outputs that aren't recognized. So in the ways that research output, su output success is currently uh, measured. So reports and things like that might not even be taken into consideration. And all the while, indigenous researchers are mentoring students, they're building capacity in community, uh, educating the public, uneducating the public, because learning and unlearning are both very necessary in order to establish anti-colonial societies. Um, we're attending ceremonies, we're braiding our community connections into every component of a single project even though we might have 12 projects on the go. We're going through university ethics boards, community ethics boards, community gatherings. We're traveling long distance away from our families and our homes to ensure that our relationships are strong. Uh, we're answering every call, every email, every concern with grateful understanding. We respect our nations and the knowledge that they have to share deeply. And we are ensuring that in everything that we do we are giving back just as much and so sometimes that means showing up to build the wigwam attending celebrations being there for our communities no matter the demand and sometimes that means not being there traveling all the way across the province arriving to find out that you can't be there at this time 
you have to go. You have to turn around and go home. Um, we'll call you when you can come back because something tragic or traumatic happened in the community and it is not the time for you to be there and they need space. Um, we do these things because we value and respect everything our communities have to offer and share. And, and this goes on, this goes on. So once the projects are complete, our relationships have only really just begun. We will continue to stoke that fire of our relationships because we know that research is needed to improve lives. And the research relationship can't be a one and done situation or that trust that we spent so long building will be gone. On top of all this, in the world of Indigenous health research, we're often women. We work beyond our designated hours, beyond our designated work weeks. Uh, in pre-COVID time, that meant a lot of time away from our families, our children, our spouses. And because we're women, we do this for less money than our male counterparts. So combined, <laughs> all of these things, um, factor all factor into lower overall biometrics and also limit indigenous people's ability to secure full professor positions tenure track roles many of us are doing four different jobs to make up one job because we're, there's just such a demand for uh, the type of work that we do um, and this it just it decreases overall opportunities for people to engage with our work so the potential of that circle of it going around and growing and building we're doing it ourselves and it's not getting the uptake that it needs to get in order to um, you know, really stir those policy changes that other research um, tends to have. So, um, so this is one framework to give you kind of an example at uh, ICES, there is a very stringent, like very like years worth of relationship building in order to create this framework and um just very briefly i'm i'm recognizing the time but uh the work being done through the indigenous portfolio at ices is an example of a provincial system that recognizes this diversity uh the diversity of indigenous groups and engage in comp and engages in complex relationships that are aimed at driving first nations and UMAT data governance forward and so those are uh, looking at like very ethical relationships Acknowledging the diversity of governance, acknowledging the differences in methodologies and approaches, and um, really driving, building evidence to drive and advance policies that are priorities to Indigenous folks um, through this process. And and this is just one example that you know there's still there's still so much opportunity. So in Canada. Advancing actions around Indigenous data sovereignty and governance requires acknowledging a whole health approach. And so the same way that we need to understand the impacts of colonialism and, uh, and the past in order to understand the damage that it has caused and the effects these systems, um, these systemic issues continue to have, systems that calculate biometrics and research success, maybe even employers who turn to biometrics as a method of recruitment or for employees, who are required to go through all of these necessary processes in order to get to that single recognized output and then get passed up for tenure or even better paying positions. Um, these, these kinds of things really need to acknowledge that the, the challenge is systemic. It's deeply rooted in colonial histories and it is impacting all of the things that we do and we're trying to dismantle entire systems while we're doing this work and not getting the right recognition for it um and so sometimes we also also should recognize that uh, after all of this our nations might choose not to share their information with the general public because open data is not for everyone and and so um moving forward all of these examples kind of highlight only a piece of the limitations of biometrics in relation to Indigenous data, kind of only the things that I could come up with and think of kind of on the fly, but um, metrics that consider the amount of time, energy, and effort that Indigenous researchers are putting in to support nations through reports, engagement, education, capacity building, and other means, really, they're really needed. Um, increasing the diversity of people that are funded within these spaces is a good start, and I see that that's happening in, in a lot of these spaces, um, but considerations to how, how Indigenous populations can be more actively engaged in this knowledge creation process uh, are needed. So some may argue that it's a choice 
either we as indigenous scholars strive for long, strong, sorry, strong, resilient, health, um, healthy and self-determined communities, or uh, we advance our academic careers. And, and sometimes that's kind of the choice that's placed before us and uh, that there is no weaving these systems together. But I argue that a redistribution of power and land and challenging and changing the systems that we work in and the way that we think about success uh, through continued education, things like these conversations that I'm kind of looking at you right now, um, we can really change how success is measured. So if you have the capacity, if you have the ability, step back, let Indigenous peoples lead, use your privilege to advocate for Indigenous state of sovereignty and governance, and, and in these spaces um, to advance Indigenous priorities and, you know, the measures that are used to, you know, decide whether or not we're successful. Openly adopt Indigenous state of sovereignty and governance principles and enable Indigenous leadership in decision making. I also have some uh, open access books. If you are interested in learning more about Indigenous state of sovereignty, these are all PDFs you can download online. Indigenous state of sovereignty, um, do, 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 uh, the state of open data, good data, and Indigenous state of sovereignty and policy. They're not my books per se. They're just some books I'm sharing with you that are really great and, and written by um, international colleagues of mine. And um, although I, I did co-author one of the chapters in the very last book on policies in Canada. So um, information, data and research about our people collected about us, with us or by us, belong to us and must be cared for by us is a quote by Elizabeth Medicine Crow. And I really think that a continued shift in the way mainstream spaces perceive academic success is needed. And uh, we need to start celebrating and honoring the lived experiences and the knowledges that Indigenous researchers, communities, and nations have to offer. Shimikwech, everybody. Wow. Okay. Uh, uh, th thank you so much, uh, Robin, for that uh, very comprehensive.